Good afternoon. Thank you for watching this talk today as part of the O'Driscoll clan gathering in West Cork. My name is Sarah Kerr. I'm a medieval archaeologist and I'm from Northern Ireland, but I'm currently based in Aarhus University in Denmark. And in my work, I research my favourite thing, and that's castles. In particular, I'm interested in late medieval castles and castles which are at risk from climate change. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Dunanor, the late medieval castle built by the O'Driscolls on Cape Clare Island, which is at risk from climate change, particularly storm surges, sea level rise and high winds. Now, I know that some of you, maybe even most of you, will be well aware of this castle. So I'm going to tell you what I know about it, but I hope in time you'll tell me what you know about it. I quite firmly believe that when it comes to local heritage and archaeology, the community often know more than the professionals. So I hope that anything I get wrong or leave out, I encourage you to get in touch with me and let me know. For my research, I really want to include the local knowledge. So I do hope you'll take me up on that and get in touch with your opinions, perspectives, resources, whatever it may be. Um, and you can see my contact details on this slide. So today I'm going to talk about Dunanor, which was constructed in the late medieval period. That is the period from around 1350 to 1650. And it is a castle or more accurately, a tower house. Now, for anyone less familiar with Irish castles, you might look at Dunanor and think it's rather a disappointing castle. It's not like those castles built by the Anglo-Normans of the 13th century, such as Roscommon or Trim. Rather, Dunanor is a type of castle known as a tower house. And for those of you who know tower houses, you may be thinking, I see several of these every day. And you'd be perfectly correct, because tower houses are almost synonymous with the Irish landscape. There are a huge number of them remaining visible, and there once were many, many more. Estimations of extant remains vary around 1300 across the island of Ireland. But during the medieval period, there may have been as many as over 3000, according to some estimations, or even as many as 7000 once standing. So in short, we don't know how many there were, but there were many. Terry Barry, a medieval historian from Trinity College Dublin, once said that Ireland was the most castellated country in Europe in the late medieval period, while others have said that Ireland was at least one of the most castellated parts of the British and Irish Isles. And you can see why they thought this based on this map of known tower houses by Vicky McAllister. The density of tower houses varies across Ireland, with considerably fewer in Connacht and Ulster in the west and north than in Munster and Leinster in the south and east. And within Munster, we can see pockets of high density, including the coastline of West Cork, as indicated by the blue line on the map. So if we consider these words from before that Ireland was one of the most castellated parts of Europe, then we can draw that down to think of West Cork as one focal point of the, that activity. West Cork contains 47 known tower houses. Of course, there were once many more than this that have been lost. And the majority are concentrated along the jagged coast where the land meets the Atlantic. The West Cork tower houses are of particular interest to a medieval archaeologist like myself for two reasons. Firstly, tower houses are the only castle type remaining in the area of West Cork. The area lacks any evidence of earlier types of stone built castles. So the sprawling Anglo-Norman castles seen at Trim in the earlier slide, there are no parallels of that type of castle in the West Cork area. Secondly, Contemporary written evidence allows the majority of Cork Tower Houses to be attributed to a certain clan. That in turn reveals how densely packed with castles the area was in the late medieval period. And in part, that's how we know that Dunanor was built by the O'Driscolls in the 16th century. So with Tower Houses being a type of castle, they share features which are normally seen on all types of castles, such as matriculations, battlements and narrow slit windows. But where they are very different from other types of castles is in their form, so the shape of the Tower House is quite distinct. Tower Houses are towers. They were comprised of at least three storeys, so they were tall and usually narrow. Now to build in that way, a slight batter was required, and that means the walls were thicker at the base than at the top. That meant that rooms in the upper floors were slightly larger as the walls were thinning with height. 
Plus, there were more windows higher up the tower. They were also bigger, whereas windows near the base of the tower were small and sparse in order to keep a strong, solid fabric. And you can see these features in the photo of Desert Tower House. The ground floor was usually vaulted and vaults on other floors were fairly common too. And this was a practical measure as a vaulted ceiling, so a stone ceiling, would act as a fire break in what was otherwise an enormous chimney. Then at the top of the tower house, there was usually a crenellated parapet and a wall walk with a pitched wooden roof, as you can see at Burnchurch. But that isn't to say that all tower houses are the same. Rather, there's a great deal of variation. For example, which floor was vaulted would vary. The door level could be on the ground floor or the first floor or both. And other variations which seem to be dependent on regional preferences. So no two tower houses were the same, even those within the same area. However, there are regional trends. So for example, those which remain in West Cork almost exclusively had two entrances rather than a single entrance. And that type of tower house is known as a dual entrance tower house. And what were tower houses built for? What was their function? The study of castles more broadly has long been concentrated with the military aspect of castles. But as the study of castles or castleology continued, it became clear that they were homes. They were high status, comfortable homes. And that is true of tower houses too. They were comfortable homes. So viewing tower houses as purely defensive buildings is now an outdated interpretation. But rather than view tower houses as either defensive castle or comfortable home, it's important to view these together. Buildings did not simply have one function. So the recent research on castles and tower houses has helped us better understand the multiple functions of buildings, including tower houses. So as well as being comfortable homes, tower houses had an important role in social advancement. They were displays of wealth and social status. Plus they were foci of administrative control of an area. That being said, however, they could withstand and deter raiding and minor feuding, so they were not completely separate from having a defensive function, although primarily they deterred raiding than, say, being involved in a siege. So that is a little bit of an overview on tower houses. Now I want to discuss Dunanor. Dunanor is located on a headland on the northwest of Cape Clare. And the first thing to point out is the risks posed to Dunanor, and I think this footage demonstrates those quite clearly. The tower house and its immediate landscape are precarious, unconsolidated and unprotected against the Atlantic and its storms. Ireland is experiencing the effects of climate change already and will continue to experience them. This includes warmer wetter winters, warmer drier summers, and a higher frequency and intensity of storm activity and cyclones, and of course, sea level rise. Of Ireland's 140,000 known sites of archaeological interest, it is clear that not all of these will survive the effects of climate change, and even more distressing is the likelihood that some will be lost within our lifetime. So this risk to Dunanor is something which really drew me to researching it, but also because it's a really interesting tower house, and now I'm going to tell you why. So from an, an architectural standpoint, Dunanor is unusual, but this may not be apparent at first glance. And for this slide, I want to thank Fanola Finlay for the photographs. Dunanor looks like a fairly commonplace tower house. It's four-storied and it's rectangular in plan. It measures eight by seven meters. There's a vaulted ceiling within. However, it doesn't occur over the ground floor, which is fairly common, nor on the first floor, which would also be common. At Dunanor, the stone ceiling separated the second and third floors, and the vault was in the form of three pointed arches separated from one another by overlapping slabs, and this can just about be seen in the central photograph. The ceilings of the ground and first floors were timber as indicated by the surviving corbels. It has a garderobe tower, which was the toilet, projecting from the south wall to the east of the main doorway. But this is where Dunanor is unusual. Unlike the majority of West Cork tower houses, it doesn't have two entrances, it just has the one entrance. Now, usually for West Cork tower houses, there is an entrance on the ground floor and on the second floor as shown in the drawing on the slide. 
The entrance into the ground floor was often accessed to storage and a second door on the first floor led to the accommodation and living spaces such as the hall. This was the most common form in West Cork, most likely because as a coastal area, the Tower House had a higher risk of being raided than those inland. So by having one entrance into the target of the raid, the storage area, they kept the other spaces in relative safety and possibly avoided a skirmish. There is also the consideration that late medieval society was very stratified and maintaining the hierarchy was important. So lower status people would use one door, the ground floor door, reserving the higher status first floor door for the higher status occupants. But in this way, Dunanor is a West Cork anomaly. There was only one door on the ground floor. It led into the ground floor and to the other floors via a mural staircase, which is a staircase within the thickness of the wall. So it didn't follow the same plan as most other West Cork tower houses, such as um, the example in the diagram. And this is an interesting point to consider, whether the O'Driscolls at Dunanor did not need to demonstrate the social hierarchy in that way, or they didn't need this extra defensive feature of a double door. It certainly seems odd when we consider the fairly constant threats of raids and robbery in the area. For example, Dunalong on Shirkin Island was attacked by Waterford citizens in 1537. This lack of dual entrance at Dunanor suggests that it was distinct from the other O'Driscoll castles, but why was it built in a different way and is this indicative of some social importance? So in this map, we can see just two of the other O'Driscoll castles in West Cork. There were 12 in total, and one of these would have been the centre of the O'Driscoll administration, but I've just highlighted the two that I'm going to point out today. Dunnashod will of course be known to you, the castle in the village of Baltimore. Now, it's not technically classified as a tower house. The government's sites and monuments record listed as an early 17th century fortified house. However, there is archaeological evidence to suggest it replaced an earlier O'Driscoll Tower and a Norman castle before that. Rather than tall and narrow as at Dunanor, Dunnashod measures 20 metres north-south and is just two storeys high. This development of Dunnashod and continuous occupation suggests that it was of central importance to the O'Driscoll's control of the area. In particular, the development from a tower house to a fortified house around the early 17th century implies a growing importance or even a shift towards its importance at that specific time. And an interesting temporal relationship is that Dunanor was attacked by English cannon fire in 1602 and subsequently abandoned, so just prior to the development of Dunnashod. Alternatively, the centre of a Driscoll administration may have been Dunalong on Shirkin Island, suggested by its deeper water for mooring ships. And possibly the main castle around this time changed to Baltimore as the O'Driscoll's control of the area shifted. Unlike Dunnashod or Dunalong, something that makes Dunanor almost unique is that it has retained its bond. For this slide, I have included a plan of the Dunanor remains. So you can see the tower house with its entrance on the south side and those spiky lines are hashers and they illustrate the extent of the headland. And a bawn is an enclosure wall surrounding a castle and their survival at tower houses is incredibly rare. As such, when they do survive, they can tell us a great deal about medieval life. You'll remember earlier I said there were over a thousand surviving tower houses, yet survival of bonds is far less common. There are some arguments that not all tower houses had bonds, thus explaining why there are so few left, but now it's accepted that most tower houses did indeed have bonds, but they simply do not survive as well into the modern period. On the plan, we can see that Dunanor's bond measured 30 metres east-west and 20 metres north-south, and it extended from the tower house to occupy the majority of land exposed at high tide. And as you can see in the plan, it abuts the tower house rather than enclosing it completely. Now, the reason a bond is so important is it reveals a fuller picture of life in the tower house. A tower house didn't exist alone. There were other buildings within the complex, certainly for storage and possibly accommodation for lower status people such as servants and slaves. 
So the survival of a bawn helps us understand how the tower house was used and how people lived. So what does Dunanora's bawn tell us? There are some suggestions that there was a kitchen to the east of the tower house, as there seems to be evidence of a bread oven. It seems there were storage areas and a number of other buildings, such as one abutting the west wall of the tower house. However, we don't know what all of these spaces were used for. This hints at how the tower house was not isolated, rather the entire bawn was used daily with lots of movement in and out of the tower itself. Within the bond, there was also a D-shaped tower at the northwest corner, and this was probably a lookout point, demonstrating Dunanor's role in the economics of the area. So the Odriscals there were overseeing the movement of goods, as well as charging passage for vessels for anchorage, victualling, and exploitation of the waters in Roaring Water Bay. And this shows that the Odriscals at Dunanor were highly connected, not only with other Odriscals and the Irish coast, but the North Atlantic seascape. The survival of Dunanor's Bawn and the potential for learning more from it provides almost a sense of extreme luck, considering that the headland is partially collapsed and the risks posed to the entire tower house from the encroaching sea. It really is so fortunate that the Bawn still exists today and there's that opportunity to learn more about medieval society. The last point I want to mention on what makes Dunanor so special is the evidence for long-term occupation. I mentioned earlier that Dunnashad had retained evidence for long-term occupation from the Norman period onwards, but the evidence at Dunanor takes us right back to the early medieval or even prehistoric period. To discuss this, I return to the photograph from the beginning of the presentation. Here we are looking at the island of Cape Clare in the forefront of the image, not only the headland upon which Dunanor sits. And if you look in the field at the centre of the image, you may be able to detect some earthworks. And they can be seen more clearly on this photograph. So this is on the main part of the island, to the east of the tower house, where the land slopes upwards towards the higher central part of Cape Clare. And this north facing slope is the only land approach to the tower house and upon it there are a number of earthen banks. On this aerial image you can see the location of the tower house, the blue dot, then on the islands the earthen banks. The most prominent bank, bank 1 highlighted in red, measures around 55 metres in length and sweeps from an outcrop on the left and runs roughly northeasterly towards the cliff edge. At its tallest, it reaches 1.3 metres in height and slopes towards the location of the tower house, that is, the internal side of the bank faces the tower house. It is three connecting linear stretches, with the northernmost broken by what may have been an entrance through the bank as the gap is about three metres wide. It appears to be the remains of a bank separating, or protecting even, the tower house from the remainder of the island. As you can see from the image, there is a secondary bank which runs inland for 80 metres from the cliff edge, but it's considerably smaller in height, just half a metre, and in width it's 1.5 metres. And this suggests that it's much later and it didn't have um, a defensive use. So the presence of these banks changes our understanding of Dunanor. In archaeological terms, the headlands would be considered a coastal promontory fort, that is, a human-made fortified structure upon a naturally occurring headland. And there are a huge number of coastal promontories in Ireland, with estimations varying up to around 500. However, there are only around a dozen promontories excavated, so dating evidence is scant. But it is thought the majority were constructed in the Iron Age or even Late Bronze Age period while comparative studies have indicated that some coastal promontories may have been constructed or reused in the early medieval period, particularly the smaller ones. So what we're seeing in essence is evidence of occupation predating the Dunanora Tower House by possibly at least 700 years. Let us now consider the late medieval Odriscals. Why did they select this spot for the castle? You might say, correctly, due to its strategic position overlooking the bay, and that seems perfectly likely, but why this particular promontory? On Cape Clare, there are eight other promontories that have some archaeological remains and indeed are listed as national monuments. 
A similar example to Dunanor is this promontory I've indicated with a red circle situated further east along the northern coastline. Its connection to the mainland is also eroding, but on the mainland there are three earthen banks less than one metre in height, severely eroded and there's shallow remains of three ditches as well. Then approximately 350 metres east from the second promontory is yet another promontory with two earthen banks separating it from the island. The inner is 75 centimetres in height while the outer is 1.5 metres and they're spaced around 3 metres apart. The most southerly promontory of the island is slightly different from the others as it utilised a stone wall to create its boundary and it projects in a, in a southwesterly direction. So what we're seeing here is a series of occupied promontories, possibly in the Iron Age or early medieval period, but the Dunanora promontory was selected as the location for the O'Driscoll Castle. I now want to build on this with some place name evidence. It is estimated that over 90% of place names in Ireland are of Gaelic origin, with the majority now anglicised. The process of anglicisation, whereby Gaelic place names were spelt according to the conventions of English phonology and spelling, began in the 12th century. Therefore, relying on place name evidence is tricky and indeed often contentious. So it cannot be wholly relied on, but in combination with other modes of research, it can be incredibly informative. The word Dune, as in Dune and Or, Dune Along and Dune Shod, is Gaelic for stronghold or fort. And it's found across Ireland in names describing well over a thousand sites, townlands and areas. Yet despite the frequency, it's actually less common than other Gaelic words related to a human occupied landscape, such as Rath, means ring fort, or Lis, which means enclosure. So this comparative low usage might be taken to indicate that the word Dune was reserved for sites of some prestige. Now, as far as I know, although do correct me if I'm wrong, there are no early medieval or, or prehistoric activities recorded for any of the other O'Driscoll castles which retain the word Dune in their name. So the archaeological and place name evidence for long-term occupation at Dunanor allows us to explore why the O'Driscolls chose this spot for one of their castles. And of course, you'll be aware of the Corkily Kingdom. And we must consider if the continuation of the place name Dune is intangible evidence of early medieval activity and whether the bank is physical evidence of this activity. Is this in combination evidence of early O'Driscoll's on the headlands? Was this occupied by the Corkily? Was it continuously occupied? Alternatively, was it abandoned but retained some social or cultural significance that led the O'Driscolls to build their castle on that particular promontory? Was Dunnor, with its bawn and its unusual form, one of the central castles in the O'Driscoll control of the area? And did it even supersede some of the other castles in its significance? As often is the case with research in its early stages, there are many more questions than answers. And I hope to continue to research Dunanor and answer these questions more concretely in time. For now, I hope I've stressed just how interesting this tower house is, even if there are several hundred of them in Ireland. I want to close now by returning to what I said right at the beginning about climate change. The tower house and its immediate landscape are under threat from the increased risks that climate change is bringing. Exposed on a cliff edge and partially collapsed, the long-term survival is unlikely. With this in mind, I'm collecting everything I can in relation to Dunanor. I'm an archaeologist, but I see archaeology as just one part of the story and climate change is another part. But there are many more parts to Dunanor's story, including literature, poetry, art, oral history and so on. And I want to include these in my research of Dunanor. So I've been compiling this information into an online map, which you can see on the screen now, which I hope will act as a way to even visit the site as it becomes impossible to visit physically. So I'm ending this talk with a request that you'll share your, your part of the Duna Nora story, whether that's a personal story of a time you visited, photos or drawings or pictures, or any information that you have about it in the past or present. And if you're interested in contributing to some research, please do get in touch. So here are my details again. I'd love to hear from you. 
Thank you for listening and I hope you enjoy the remainder of the clan celebration. Thanks.